Welcome to Heartbeat. Thank you for taking the time out of your week to grow in your faith. Now, today's Heartbeat is a little bit longer than usual. Rosemary is going to share with us in just a moment and the words that she has are to encourage you in your faith and wherever you are at in life. So get ready and be prepared to hear from Rosemary. Can I also let you know that you can also listen to this on our podcast, Heart Catholic Women. So maybe if you've got a busy day, you're out driving for the day, it's great to just chuck it on and have a listen and see what God has to say to you. So get ready to be encouraged today. Well, hello everyone. It's lovely that you can be with us this week at Heartbeat. And today I wanna to share with you about waiting. We all have had to do it. We might be waiting in a queue to get up to the front of the counter to ask our questions. We might be waiting for answers in prayer. Whatever it is in life, we often have to wait. I know that times I've had to wait for my children as I've, you know, they've finished their sport and you're waiting in the car for it to be finished so you can pick them up and take them home. Wherever it is, there is a purpose that God uses for our waiting. And I want to give you some tools to use for you to make it easier, happier, better when we are waiting. And it's very much written by God because the Holy Spirit brings life into the word, the, the scriptures. So it's written by God to give us ways and means of how we should be in our waiting. And it's in the book of Acts. So I'm going to read a little bit to you and then I'm going to pull it apart and share bits with you. And it's when Paul and Silas and he picks up Timothy along the way and they eventually get down to Macedonia. But before they get to Macedonia and it's in chapter 16, they try to go to other places because they think, oh, we should go here and preach the word. We should go here. We should go here. And it, it's like at every turn, there's, there's a no, there's a can't, can't get there. Things, you know, it doesn't explain totally, but things happen. And they can't get there. And then Paul has a vision. And he sees this man asking him, would you please come, come over to Macedonia and help us. And I'm going to start from that point because I want to share with you, again, some things that we need to do when we're waiting. So it's chapter 16 in the book of Acts. Verse 10, when he had seen the vision, he had once endeavoured to go on to Macedonia, confidently inferring that God had called us to proclaim glad tidings to them. Setting sail for Troas, he came in a direct course and from there he came to Philippi, which is the chief city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We stayed on this place some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gates and preached there. One of the places where they were preaching was in the marketplace. And again, it's in God's plan, but Paul doesn't always know this. We don't always know the plans of God while we're waiting. We're preaching, we're, you know, he's going to Macedonia. He thinks this is where now God has sent him. And they go to the marketplace because in those days, the marketplace was where everyone was, where the crowds were, where they could get up on uh, you know, a, pl a place and start sharing the word, start sharing about Christ. And he's, Paul sits down and he addresses some women who were assembled there. And one of these women, it says, was Lydia. So it's Acts 16, verse 14. One of those who listened to us was a woman named Lydia a dealer in fabrics dyed in purple. She was already a worshipper of God and the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. When she was baptised along with her household, she earnestly entreated us saying, If in your opinion I am really convinced that Jesus is the Messiah and the author of life, then I will be faithful to the Lord. Come to my house and stay. And she induced them to come. As they were on our way, their way to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl. 
Now this slave girl was possessed. This slave girl started crying out and telling the crowd around that these men knew the Most High God. And Paul and Silas at the time didn't wanted to preach in their own way. They didn't want someone else to, um, I guess, muck up people's minds and thoughts because it, 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 it wasn't, they don't want it coming from a girl who doesn't know Christ. This, this girl who had a um, demon within her that could, that could recognise the Christ within Paul and Silas. So Paul tells this girl, or this demon, to get out of the girl. Anyway, they come to Lydia's household, and at the time, at now they've got Paul and Silas, Timothy, and actually Luke. Luke is the actual um, writer of this section. He and these four men who come to the household stay with Lydia, stay for a while and share, preach Christ because they've come to Macedonia and they've done it in the marketplace and Lydia's receptive and they've come and now to her household. And they've, they've started sharing and Lydia's household comes to hear the word of God. Do you know that Lydia must have been someone who had some means because she's in the marketplace selling cloth that is purple only kings or royalty or people of, you know, high esteem would buy purple cloth, would even be able to afford purple cloth. So Lydia herself is fairly wealthy. Lydia then also invites these four men to come back to her household. She must have a big enough house to have her household, which is her family, her servants, and invite these four men and they didn't just stay for a meal they stayed they slept over so they would have had a big enough house to actually have these people come so God in his great plan first tells Paul or stops Paul going somewhere else and it's like God's guidance was at first negative he was guiding Paul to don't go there I want you to go to here then he gives Paul a vision. So he has this vision of a man in Macedonia say, come. He felt like God said, come to Macedonia. He goes to Macedonia. He preaches in the marketplace. And there is that, this woman, Lydia, who has some type of means, wealth. If she's in the marketplace bargaining, it means she's a widow. Her husband's not there because it's normally the men who did that in the marketplace. But she... It has, has, uh, must have some sort of ways and means and esteem held by other people towards her because she was allowed to be in the marketplace. And so God is setting it up that Paul then is not only preaching to Lydia and her household, but is allowing down the track, because you, you read it if you continue further, Lydia then becomes a ways and means that helps with her wealth so that Paul can preach to others. Go buy the tickets to go on the boats. Go buy the food so they, and the nourishment that they will need to be on the journey to go share from village to village to village about Jesus Christ. God sets up things if we just wait. Now, Paul, if you read other parts of um, scripture. Paul is a fiery man. Do you not think he would have been impatient when it's like, oh, can't get to this town. Oh, can't get to this town. Oh my goodness. He wouldn't have gone, okay, Lord, it's okay. No, he would have frustrated him. But in the waiting, he learnt to wait on God more. He learnt to be patient more. He learnt that God would guide him and he did in a vision. And it doesn't say this, but I can see that this would have happened within him because God doesn't work just on our circumstances. He works within us. He helps us in our waiting. Yes, he can make a cue go faster. He can make answers be answered, prayers be answered. But it's within us that he works. 
because that's the most important thing that he cares about. He doesn't care about the other as much he cares about our relationship with him, how we are going. So in the waiting, God is setting up these wonderful things. They're not just a story. It's a wonderful God glory being shown. But he doesn't stop there. So Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke are all there preaching the word. Paul might be the loudest and the, and the spokespeople, but the others were there because they were learning or they were helping with pastoral care or they were, they were serving. And Paul was there and because Paul then told this demon in this young girl to get out, the people who had used this young girl, they'd used her, they used what she could do were upset because they probably weren't earning any money anymore because they're probably saying, you know, come and spend money and this, this girl will tell you, you know, your life history or, you know, or whatever she was going to be doing. And they were angry and annoyed. So they went to the magistrates and they basically got Paul and Silas thrown into jail. And we pick up the story again when Paul and Silas are in jail. So it's Acts 16, verse 20. And when they had brought them before the magistrates, they declared these fellows are Jews and they are throwing our city into great confusion. They encourage the practice of customs, which is unlawful for us Romans to accept or observe. Do you notice that, yes, Paul and Silas are Jews, but Paul doesn't tell anybody that he's also a Roman citizen. He keeps that to share later. So he allows to be thrown because he could say, ah, you can't, you can't take, throw me into jail. I'm a Roman citizen. No, he allowed whatever God was doing with him in this story. Then he didn't know the story at the time, but with him to see what God was going to do. He had trust. The crowd joined in the attack and they ha were beaten, they were struck with many blows, they threw them into prison, charging the, the jailer to keep them safe. So the jailer is told to keep them safe. And having received such a strict charge, he put them into the inner prison of the prison. So it's like, imagine, and we, we can, we've seen it on TV, where you have, you know, the metal bars, and then you go into an internal part, and an internal, and so the deepest part of the dungeon is where they got put. And they're locked up, but they're also chained. No way to get out. And what happens in this waiting? About midnight, as Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them as well. Because you imagine, you know, in a dungeon it echoes. Everything is heard by what is said and they're singing and praising to their God. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the very foundations of the prison were shaken and at once all the doors were opened and everyone's shackles were unfastened. At midnight, about midnight, when it's so late, when you think I'm never going to get an answer from God, I've been waiting and waiting and waiting you know, I want to, I want to uh, not just answer from prayers, but I want to know what is my life supposed to be? What's my purpose? Where's my gifts? Whatever questions we may have, often God puts us in a waiting period. Do you know, we're actually in a waiting period now because Jesus says, I'm going to the Father and I will come back soon on the second coming of Christ. But this is an actual waiting period. So what are we going to do in this waiting time? Paul and Silas tell us at about midnight, they start worshipping and praising God. So I chose the word wait. And the first thing we need to do is worship. If we worship and praise God. Look what happens. God comes in his timing. God comes and performs an earthquake. 
He can change natural circumstances. He can do anything he wants. And in our worship, God's praises, our praises to God, God comes and is present with us, in us. And he sends an earthquake. And what happens in the earthquake? All the locks on the prison doors are opened. The shackles that are around Paul and Silas are off. But what I love is that when we worship and praise God, it says once and for all the doors were opened and everyone's shackles, not just Paul and Silas's. When we worship God, it affects the atmosphere. When we worship God, it affects our circumstances. When we worship God, it affects other people's circumstances. It, take, it brings them freedom. It takes off their shackles and chains. It opens the prison doors when we worship God. So if you don't know what to do when you're waiting, worship. It will affect you, your circumstances, and God is so wonderful and loving, it affects other people's circumstances. The jailer was startled. Oh my goodness, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get flogged. I'm going to get killed. So he's about to take his own life. Because he probably thought if I kill myself, then I don't have to go through the torture that, that the Romans will do to me. And Paul and Silas yell out, no, 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 hang on a minute. We haven't escaped. We're still here. Because they already had true freedom in Christ. They recognised God's put them there for a purpose. So they, they, they then preached to the jailer and to all those in jail. And the jailer then says, come, come to my house. Come and preach to my household. Because again, God just doesn't leave it at one thing. He affects the environment. He affects people's hearts because he wants to set us all free. And this jailer is startled and he invites him, and, but he falls at, the peop at Paul and Silas's feet and says, what is it necessary for me to do that I may be saved? Because the jailer would have heard them singing and worshipping God. He would have known a little bit about their story. And then this miraculous earthquake comes. And miracle upon miracle, Paul and Silas don't run out of jail. They stay there. Something in his heart softens. And he wants to be saved too. He wants to be a free man. And Paul Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Take yourself out of your own keeping and entrust yourself into his keeping. And you will be saved, you and your household as well. And they declared the word of God to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them in the night and he bathed their wounds and the household got baptised. And then they come back down. They all come back down, even not just Paul and Silas, even the other prisoners. And they all come and stay and wait in the prison. And during the night, the magistrates' hearts are softened. The crowd had affected them. The crowd had said, look at, the, look at what you know, Paul and Silas have done. But the magistrates' hearts are softened. And they say, release Paul and Silas. But Paul and Silas stay there and said, no, we want an apology. And then Paul tells them, I am a Roman citizen. You have no right to put me into jail. So in the time of the waiting, when we worship God, we need to continue because in the worshipping of God, I bet you Paul and Silas still asked God to come, still asked God to release them from prison, to ask God, you know, what is the purpose of us being here in prison? So in the waiting, you've got work for worship, ah, for ask. Don't stop asking. Paul was asking 
Where should I go? Should I go here? No. Should I go here? No. Should I go? Go to Macedonia. He was given a dream, a vision. Go to Macedonia. Keep asking. You don't know what God does when we just keep asking because we keep trusting. Even though our circumstances aren't good, keep asking. Because God will answer us. But in the asking, don't fall into the trap where we want God to come into my plans. We want our plans to fit into his plans. Paul, I think I'll go there. I think I'll go there. I think I'll go there. He was trying to preach Christ, but he had plans, but they weren't God's plans. He had to come to terms with, I've got to do the will of God and fit me into God's plans. And he will guide us. He will show us if we ask. But in the asking, you take action. You actually try. Paul didn't just sit back and decided, I'm just going to pray about it. No, he prayed about it. Then he checked out to buy a boat or hire a boat to get tickets on a boat to go. No, nah, it wouldn't work. Something else he tried. No. Nope. So he's still doing stuff while he's asking. The I in wait, don't be impatient. God's timing isn't always our timing. About midnight, not long till midnight, did God come with an earthquake for Paul and Silas because they were worshipping and praising God even at that late time. God will come when he wants to come. Even if it's three days after, like Lazarus, and it's a dead, stinky tomb that Lazarus is in, God will come when God wants to come. And if he doesn't, he's got a better thing. If he doesn't say yes to that, he's got a better yes somewhere else. Do not be impatient. Do you know the people of Israel taught us that? Well, if you read about it, impatience was one of Israel's besetting sins and God was helping them learn patient obedience for it's through faith and patience that God's people inherit what he has promised. God is never in a hurry. He knows what he's doing. Just trust the plan. Trust God. And that's a quote from Warren Weasby, who um, is a Protestant pastor. Trust him. Don't be impatient. And the T, God's timing. God's timing. Maybe if Paul hadn't listened to God's timing, hadn't, hadn't trusted in God, had seen the vision and heard the man with most Macedonia and didn't just fob it off as a, oh, that's a weird dream, but sort it out. They got to Macedonia. They get to the marketplace. They didn't know Lydia was there. God knew Lydia was there. It said she knew of God, but she didn't know Christ. She didn't know the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he'd done for her on the cross. Paul preached that to her. And she brought it to her household. Who else then did it spread to? Women talk. She would have had friends. She would have had people in the marketplace that she would have shared with and said, look what's happened to me. She had means, she had wealth, she had some high esteem to be there. God went, placed her there, ready, so that Paul would come and preach to her. God's timing. God uses everything for a purpose. Everything. So do, do you think when you're waiting next time for an answer to a prayer, when you're waiting in a queue, even just simple waiting in a queue, God might be wanting to talk to you. God might want you to, while you're waiting, you talk to the person in front of you in the queue, behind you, that you actually maybe read scripture, read the word of God while you're waiting. Whatever it is, worship him. Ask and keep asking. Don't be impatient and trust in his timing. And 
it is amazing that one day I know for sure you will be able to write a story like Luke wrote down here about Paul and Silas, about what happened on just a part of their journey, trust in him and put a smile on yourself while you're waiting. So let us pray to ask God to give us grace in the waiting period. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving Father, I know how impatient I get when I have to wait so long. May I trust in your timing. May I learn patience. May I continue to ask. But more than anything, may I worship you and adore you and come to serve and love you more. Give us the grace to wait. Lord, we want to be used. We want you to work in our life. We'd like prayers answered, Lord. Help us in the waiting period. And while we're waiting for you to come back a second time, finally and for all, guide us, teach us, may we walk your way. We give you our plans so that we can actually be in your plans. In this we pray in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.